Hello, could somebody please confirm you can hear me? Yes. Thank you. All right, let's uh, wait a minute. There aren't too many people here. People will probably log in. So let me put that on hold just for a minute. Um, are there any questions? If not, let me share my screen. Today is May 25th, and we are supposed to be on chapter 14. We're going to start chapter 14, I believe. And uh, we're a little bit behind schedule. So I think I'm going to uh, lecture for a few minutes in the lab to get caught up. Any questions about any of that? Any questions about the last quiz? Uh, I noticed that uh, uh, nobody asked about it, but uh, this quiz said it was worth less than one point. Uh, that is just so that the grade book shows you your correct total of points, that this quiz will be worth the full amounts of points, but, uh, and it says it on the quiz, uh, I have it down to less than one point because you get to throw out one quiz. And if I had the full points up there for this quiz, then you'll have too many points for the quizzes and your grade will be inflated. So instead of being what your real grade is, you'd have like an extra grade higher. And then when I take out the points, it would go back to what it should be. And then students will get upset. So I've got this quiz is showing uh, less than one point, And that way your grade will not be inflated. I will go in and manually correct that. That's what the column 5C, quiz 5C is. So this quiz will be worth the full amounts of points, but then in the column drop quiz, I'll put your lowest quiz there, and then those points will be pulled out of your score. Any questions about any of that? All right. Um... Another thing I want to mention is, is that there was some question about uh, uh, my notes and why I don't show you my notes until after I'm done with the lesson. And let me rem remember to show lab eight, by the way, because we're now done with that. Uh, chapter. The reason why I don't show you the slides is because I want you guys to take your own notes. You will learn best if you take your own notes and then you just remember better uh, from your own notes. So taking notes itself helps you remember the material twice as well than if you just listen. So your recall will be twice as great if you take notes as opposed to just listen. And second, students learn better from their own notes than somebody else's notes. So I want you guys to take your own notes. And that is why I do not show the slides until after we're done with the lesson. Any question about that? And I did tell you this at the very start of the term. And I did ask you, how many times do you need to go over something to actually learn it? And the question is, the answer is to that question is, you need to go over it about 20 times. And even if you're taking notes, you're listening and then taking the notes, that's only two times. And so you're not going to be remembering much 
of the lesson, even if you only take notes, but it's twice as good than if you didn't take notes. Any question about any of that? Now I see why there's a few complaints. Nobody reminded me to show the slides after we were done with them. All right, chapter three is good, chapter two is good. All right, any questions about any of that? Uh, this is actually more work for myself that I'm doing to try and help you guys learn. So I hope you do appreciate a little bit about that. All right, let's begin chapter 14. I don't think we started this, but maybe we did. Oh, where is it? There it is. No, this is from an earlier time. Can anyone confirm? I'm thinking we did not start chapter 14. Is that correct? Can anyone confirm that? I think we started it. Uh, how far did we get? Oh, wait a minute. I was thinking of Tuesday. All right, today's Thursday, in which case... Uh, we're supposed to finish chapter 14 and start chapter 13. So you're right, we did start it. So that was the correct place where I had that marker. So let's go there. Redisposing factors, where is that? There it is. So we talked about the predisposing factors that make a person more susceptible to coming down with a disease. So let's talk about the development of disease. Once uh, the host defenses are breached, disease development typically follows a certain sequence. And this sequence tends to be similar for both acute and chronic diseases. Let me blow this slide up. From when the patient first has the disease-causing organism until the patient has the first signs and symptoms, this period is known as the incubation period. During the incubation period, the organism is growing and increasing in number, but there are not enough of the disease-causing organisms for the patient to have any signs or symptoms. So they're below a threshold and the patient has no signs or symptoms. When the patient first has signs and symptoms, and the signs and symptoms are mild, we call that the prodromal period. Following the prodromal period, we have the period of illness where the signs and symptoms are the most severe. When the patient starts feeling better, such as when the patient's fever breaks or the patient just starts feeling better, we then call that the period of decline. And in the period of decline, the 
disease-causing organisms are no longer increasing in number, they're actually decreasing in number. But the patient still has signs and symptoms. The period of decline continues until the patient has no more signs or symptoms. And that begins the period of convalescence. Now note that in the period of convalescence, the patient still has the disease-causing organisms. It's just that the number of microbes causing the disease are below the threshold number, and so the patient has no signs or symptoms. Any questions about the stages of disease? There are a couple of points to make out here, and that is, first, not all the different periods of illness show up on all diseases. For example, I've sometimes been feeling quite fine, no signs or symptoms, and then suddenly it feels like somebody hit me over the head with a sledgehammer, and then I have signs and symptoms of the flu. So sometimes with the flu, there is no prodromal period. You're in the incubation period, and then you're in the period of illness. There are also some diseases that have no period of decline or period of convalescence. And these are the diseases that typically either they don't get better or the patient dies. Um, something like uh, hepatitis B or C that causes chronic liver disease, the patient never gets better. They're always in the period of illness until they die. And then something like AIDS, which used to kill patients. Nowadays, they have medication to keep patients alive for almost a normal lifespan. It's just a little shorter. And uh, But in the old days, before they had that modern medication, the patient would get AIDS and then eventually would die. And so they never left the period of illness until they died. They never entered a period of decline or a period of convalescence. Any questions about the different periods of the stages of disease? If there's no questions, I've got a question for you. During what period of illness is a patient unable to uh, spread disease to another patient? Anyone going to guess? Or are we just going to sit here and wait? Convalescence. That would be a good guess because the patient has no signs or symptoms and then you are getting better. But in reality, you do have a little bit of the disease causing organisms. So even in the period of convalescence, this patient can spread the disease to another patient. For some diseases, such as the colds and the flus, which are very common diseases of humans, at least among adults, the most likely time to spread the colds and the flus are late in the incubation period or in the prodromal period. And why this is the case is because the uh, patient's immune system has not kicked in yet in an adult. And so they're more likely to spread the disease late in the incubation period and in the prodromal period. In the period of illness, the patient's, in an adult, the patient's immune system has kicked in. And so they're less likely to spread the disease, at least for colds and flus. Now in children, this is not the case. Their immune system doesn't seem to kick in and then decrease the uh, 
chance of spreading the disease in the period of illness. But for adults, this does happen. And this is probably an evolutionary reason for this happening in the adult. The adult is trying to prevent spreading the disease to the adult's children. And so there's an evolutionary reason for that. And I guess the children aren't worried about spreading the disease to their parents. So that's just the way children are. Any questions about any of that? And nobody has ever answered what period of uh, stage of disease is a, a patient not uh, capable of spreading disease? It's actually a trick question. You can spread disease during every period of illness. Every period of illness, including the convalescence. I won't ask you a question like that on a quiz or an exam, but during every period, you can spread the disease because you have the disease-carrying organism in you. My mother would always tell me when she was alive, oh, I'm getting better now. I'm no longer contagious. And I would always tell her, mother, you're speaking to a microbiologist. I know better. You never... Um, you're never, the only time you don't spread disease is after the period of convalescence when you do not have the disease-causing organism. And that really isn't a period of disease because you're you've thrown off the disease. Any questions about any of that? All right, if not, let's move on to the spread of an infection. An infection of a patient has to have the disease-causing organism come to the patient. And the disease-causing organism has to come from somewhere. And we call that a reservoir of infection, a continual source of the disease-carrying organism. The reservoirs of infection can be living or non-living. A major source or reservoir of human diseases is, of course, other humans. So humans are reservoirs. This is especially true for human-only diseases like HIV and AIDS, gonorrhea. Only humans get this disease and then spread it to other humans or these diseases. And then carriers may have an inapparent infection, so they're asymptomatic, and they can spread disease also. Now, a patient who is uh, in the latent stage of disease cannot spread it as long as they're in latency, but after the disease comes out of latency, these human reservoirs can spread the disease. Any question about that? So for most humans, COVID-19 comes from a human reservoir. That wasn't the case the very first time the first human got the disease, but this disease can come from other organisms. And it is true that cats and dogs can get COVID-19 and then spread it to people. I don't think we have any cases of that, but it is true that especially cats, can get COVID-19. They seem to be a little more susceptible than dogs. And they're as susceptible as people, or at least they were. I'm not sure if that's true of the most recent strains, but of the older strains of uh, COVID-19. Cats were very susceptible. Uh, if the disease comes from an animal, we call that an animal reservoir. And for some diseases, animals are the only reservoirs, such as rabies and Lyme disease. Zoonoses are animal diseases that may be transmitted to humans. And if you don't know, when rabies hits another, it hits a human, that human cannot spread rabies. 
to another human or to anybody. I suppose if you were to get... Actually, rabies doesn't go into the blood, so even a blood transfusion wouldn't spread rabies. But uh, uh, when rabies gets into a human, it doesn't spread. You have to get rabies from uh, a rabid animal. And the reason why it spreads so easily from dogs and cats and other animals like that is the virus gets into the saliva and when the animal then bites you, you pick up the rabies. And the rabies virus does not get into the human saliva. There are also non-living reservoirs. For example, botulism and tetanus typically comes from non-living reservoir. In botulism, we're counting the canned food or the home canned food. Um, we're calling that dead, although that's at one point it was definitely alive, but but when we eat it, we we're not calling it alive. Uh, Non-living reservoirs are major sources of disease for gastrointestinal diseases, such as water and lettuce, and in third world countries, soil or water. All right, any question about the reservoirs of infection? If not, let's move on to the transmission of disease. There are three principal routes by which a causative agent of disease can be transmitted from the reservoir of infection to a susceptible host. There's contact transmission, vehicle transmission, where the disease-carrying organism is put in a vehicle, and then the vehicle brings it to the patient. So a vehicle is an object. And then there's vector transmission, where an animal, such as a mosquito, a tick, or a rabbit animal, brings the disease-carrying organism to a patient. So a vector is an animal. Any question about any of that? In contact transmission, it can be spread in three different ways. There's direct person-to-person -person transmission requiring close association between the infected individual and a susceptible host. An example of contact transmission is when you spread the disease during a handshake or when you spread the disease during a kiss. That would be direct person-to-person -person transmission. Indirect Contact transmission is when the disease-causing organism gets on something else from the patient and then goes to a new susceptible host. And this object, which is carrying the disease-carrying, the disease-causing organism, we call a fomite. So when somebody is sick and they sneeze into their hands or something like that, and then they touch money, the disease-causing organism gets on the money, and then they pay for the object, and then the cash register gives you back that money, and then you touch the money, and then you uh, inoculate yourself, usually by touching the money and then touching the uh, mucous membrane in your face. That's indirect contact transmission. We'll show you another uh, indirect contact transmission where uh, a baseball is spreading it among ball players. There's a third way of doing contact transmission. I'm not going to test you on this because I consider it sort of an arbitrary distinction. It's droplet transmission. Droplet transmission is considered contact transmission. It's transmission via an airborne droplet that travels less than one meter. If it travels more than one meter, it is not droplet transmission, and it's also not contact transmission. And we'll explain that right here. 
So when somebody sneezes, this would be about one meter. And if you pick it up within one meter, it's considered droplet transmission. But you'll notice that there are airborne particles carrying the disease carrying organism more than one meter. And that is not called droplet transmission. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But they're coming from the same sneeze. And one is contact transmission, the other is not. A direct, like I said, handshake, or in this case, I-5, spreading the disease-clearing organism from this patient to that patient. Indirect, when uh, somebody sneezes, and then they touch the baseball, and then the baseball is thrown to, it looks like the catcher. And... Uh, the catcher touches the baseball to throw it, and then he picks up the disease-carrying organism. Indirect transmission. Any question about any of these? Remember, I'm not going to quiz you on droplet because I just consider this line at one meter to be a little bit arbitrary. It's the same sneeze. And so I won't quiz you on droplet transmission. And the uh, third one is airborne transmission. Anything that's beyond one meter is or airborne transmission. An airborne transmission is not considered a direct transmission. It's considered vehicle transmission. And like I said, that's just too complex. I won't quiz you on that. Uh, vehicle transmission is when an the disease carrying object is, uh, excuse me, the disease carrying organism is transferred to an object or airborne. And uh, then the object carries the disease carrying organism to another host. There are three main types of vehicle transmission there's waterborne transmission, foodborne transmission and then airborne transmission. Waterborne transmission is when uh, the disease-carrying organism gets in the water, like contamination by sewage causes waterborne transmission. This is very rare in a first world country, but it's quite common in third world countries, waterborne transmission. Now, I suppose if somebody were sick and then carry, uh, put their finger in your cup and then fill your cup with water, uh, that would be waterborne transmission. And uh, that happens in this country. Not often, but it does happen. Foodborne transmission is when somebody was sick and then they uh, touch the food and the food becomes contaminated with the organism. And then the next patient eats the food. Uh, this usually happens with uncooked food. The nice thing about cooking the food is that it tends to kill the disease-carrying organism. So when the food is cooked, it's actually rare that the disease-carrying organism is uh, carried and, and foodborne transmission occurs. But when you're eating uh, food that isn't cooked, diseases are more likely to spread, such as salads and, I don't know, maybe a hamburger bun that's not cooked. All right, any question about vehicle transmission? If not, let's talk a little more about vector transmission. Vector transmission is when an animal carries the disease to a patient, a human. The most important group of vectors are the biting arthropods, especially fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. They're more likely to carry disease to a patient than other arthropods, but any arthropod can spread disease. There's two ways that vectors may transmit disease. There's mechanical transmission and biological transmission. Mechanical transmission is passive, 
where, for example, this fly is touching the disease carrying organism on its feet, and the fly passively picks up the disease carrying organism on its feet. And then the fly goes and lands on something else like this hamburger, bringing in the disease-carrying organism to the hamburger. And then the hamburger is eaten by the patient. This is an example of mechanical transmission of vector transmission. Biological transmission is also vector transmission. However, in biological transmission, the pathogen actually reproduces inside the vector. An example of biological transmission is when the bite of a mosquito transmits malaria. Malaria is growing within the mosquito, and then the mosquito transmits malaria to the patient. Biological transmission. Any question about <clears throat> vector transmission. All right. If there's no questions about vector transmission, let's move on to nosocomial infections. This is one of the most important topics you can learn in microbiology. Assuming that you are going into the allied health sciences, if you go out and work with patients, you need to know about nosocomial infections and you need to try to prevent them. A nosocomial infection, also called the hospital acquired infection, is an infection that a patient gets from staying in a hospital or a hospital like environment. So the patient did not have the disease carrying organism until they arrived in the hospital or the other allied um, health facility, like a nursing home or a clinic, something like that. And then the patient picks up this nosocomial infection simply by being in the hospital or hospital-like environment. It's estimated that 5 to 15% of all hospital patients in the United States acquire a nosocomial infection. That's 2 million people per year in the United States coming down with a nosocomial infection. And this results in 20,000 deaths each year in the United States. Now, usually what happens is with the death, the patient is in a bad shape to begin with, and then they pick up the nosocomial infection, and the nosocomial infection is enough to kill them. If they had been in better health, the nosocomial infection probably would not have killed them. Nosocomial infections are the eighth leading cause of death in the United States, and this is an old number that happened before COVID-19. So it's something like the eighth leading cause of death in the United States. Like I said, COVID-19 may have pushed it back to the ninth leading cause of death, but it's close to the eighth. Nosocomial infections happen in the hospital or hospital-like setting because of three reasons. Oops. Still are stopping going on a little. Let's go back to here. Uh, microorganisms are present in the hospital environment. The patient who is getting the nosocomial infection are oftentimes a compromised host, meaning their immune system isn't fully functioning or they're compromised in some other way. And then there's a chain of transmission of the disease carrying organism in the hospital or the hospital-like setting, resulting in a nosocomial infection. You don't really need to know much about this slide, but about one in 20 or greater patients in the United States will come down with a nosocomial infection. And this is from the Centers for Disease Control. And then about 50% of 
nosocomial infections can be prevented. About 50% of them do not need to happen. We, if we take basic steps to prevent the nosocomial infection from occurring, we will prevent it. So about half of them can be prevented. It's a major cost of money in the United States. We won't go over that. But like I said, they result from the interaction of three factors. Microorganisms are present in the hospital environment. Hospitals are a reservoir of sick patients, and many of these sick patients have a disease-carrying organism, which can become a nosocomial infection. There are also some normal microbiota, which can become opportunistic pathogens. And everyone in the hospital has normal microbiota. And so it can spread from anyone in the hospital to a susceptible patient and become an opportunistic pathogen. And then the worst of the nosocomial infections are the nosocomial pathogen, which are antibiotic resistant. So the patient gets a nosocomial infection. The doctor prescribes the normal course of antibiotics for that nosocomial infection. It's antibiotic resistant, so that doesn't work. The doctor immediately tries another antibiotic and then probably uh, orders a test on um, to determine which antibiotic's a good antibiotic to use. But the second antibiotic is also resistant and the patient dies at this point because they were in the hospital for a reason and uh, they picked up a nosocomial infection and twice the clinician tried to cure the nosocomial infection and it was antibiotic resistant. So these are the worst nosocomial infections. The patient who comes down with a nosocomial infection in the hospital or hospital-like setting is often a compromised host, one whose resistance to infection is impaired by either disease, therapy, or burns, or some combination of all of these. Broken skin and broken mucous membranes compromise the host, making the patient more susceptible to getting a nosocomial infection. Burns, injections, ventilators, urinary catheterators, the administration of anesthesia, all make the patient more susceptible to a nosocomial infection. When patients have a suppressed immune system, they're also more compromised. Drugs, radiation therapy, Burns can all weaken the immune system of the patient, making them more susceptible to acquiring a nosocomial infection. And then lastly, there's a chain of transmission of the nosocomial agent in the hospital or hospital-like setting. There are three principal routes of transmission. There can be direct contract transmission where the disease spreads from patient to patient, such as when, I don't know, two patients are sharing the same room and they, I don't know, shake hands or share a rosary or share, I'm not sure, the light switch, they turn on the light switch in the room or share the television remote control. I think most patients, even in a two-bedroom place, I think they each have a television now, but uh, initially they only had one. There's also indirect contact transmission. This is via a fomite, an object that spreads the disease-carrying organism in the hospital, such as a urinary and IV catheter can spread the disease-carrying organism contaminated surgical dressings, or simply sharing something like a pencil can result in indirect contact transmission. There's also vehicle 
or airborne transmission, such as when the ventilation system can spread the disease in the hospital. There was initially worry about COVID-19 being spread in a hospital and by vehicle transmission, meaning airborne. And now we know that's very unlikely. It can happen, but it's very unlikely because that's not the way COVID-19 tends to spread. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But COVID-19 tends to spread directly from person to person. It doesn't mean that's the way it has to spread. It can easily spread from a patient to a fomite to another patient, but it tends to spread directly from patient to patient. And it's just the way COVID-19 is. And fortunately, COVID-19 does not get in the air, even in an, airport, uh, in an airplane, which has a closed environment and just recirculates the air. COVID-19 does not tend to spread that way. It is likely to spread in an airplane, but that's more from a patient uh, getting it on the, like the bathroom uh, door handle or the bathroom light or something like that. And then somebody else uh, using that bathroom and then they pick up the disease carrying organism that way. All right, so nosocomial infections are a problem in the hospital or the hospital-like setting. How do we control them? There are certain procedures that are generally implemented to prevent a nosocomial infection. You have learned a septic technique now in the microbiological lab. When you go out into the clinic or the hospital setting, you should always apply a septic technique. And that way, if you do, you will not spread nosocomial infections. There is the proper handling of contaminated material. Use frequent and thorough hand washing. Get the disease-carrying organisms off your hands. And then there's education of the staff, patients, and visitors. Oh, about 15 years ago, they did educate the staff on nosocomial infection, but there wasn't much education of the patient and almost no education of the visitors. Nowadays, that's totally changed. In all hospitals, at least I've been in, there have been signs all over the hospital and sanitation devices all over the hospital, including outside each patient's room where the sign tells you, prevent the spread of disease, sanitize your hand before seeing a patient. And they have those signs and the um, sanitizers outside the door of the elevators and hospitals too. There are some other procedures that can be used to control nosocomial infections. Please see the online chapter notes to go over some of those procedures. Uh, one thing is like somebody who's sick and they get in the bathtub before you uh, bring in another patient, that bathtub should be sterilized. Common sense things like that. And that controls nosocomial infections. Epidemiology, the study of where and when diseases occur and how they are transmitted in populations. The CDC, that stands for Center for Disease Control, collects and analyzes the US epidemiological information. Usually what happens is certain diseases are required by law for a clinician, mainly doctors, to report these cases to the local health authorities. And so in Clark County, that would be the Clark County Health Agency. I'm not sure what that's called, but something like that. 
And then the county reports it to the state. I imagine, I'm not positive because I just moved to Washington. I imagine the uh, Clark County Health Authority and all other counties then send that information to the state. And I imagine that's in Olympia, but I don't know where the state health um, authorities are in the state of Washington. I just don't know. In Oregon, which is the state I used to live in, it's in Salem. So all the counties in Oregon send it to the health state health organization in Salem. And I imagine in Washington is in Olympia. If somebody knows, go ahead and voice it, because I just don't know where it goes and where the state uh, health authorities are in the state of Washington. I just don't know. And then the state authorities send that to the Center for Disease Control. Uh, I think that's in Georgia, wherever that is. It doesn't matter. It's wherever the Centers for Disease Control is. And then they collect it and analyze it. They then publish it in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, and they do this each week, and what's called MMWR for Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. And you can find that on www.cdc.gov. It used to be a very easy link from the website. Now I have to hunt for it. It's not quite as easy to find, but... Uh, So all reportable diseases are published each week in the MMWR by the Center for Disease Control. And one reportable disease is like malaria. The United States has that reported. If you get malaria and a clinician knows it has to be published or reported by the clinician, and you'd say, why do they have malaria? Because malaria doesn't spread in the United States. At least it doesn't spread anymore. And they got rid of malaria a long time ago just by draining the swamps. Um, but people leave this country and then go to tropics. And then they pick up the malaria and then bring it back into this country. And that's why we get malaria. Um, malaria can spread in the Gulf states. So the old South states, uh, there is the mosquito to spread malaria. And every once in a while, uh, we'll have the malaria spreading in the United States. It's been a long time. It might've been the 1960s, the last time uh, malaria was spreading. I think it was in New Orleans. And apparently somebody brought in malaria from some other place in the world, world, probably the tropics. And then the mosquito bit that patient. And then the malaria was spreading in New Orleans. And how they controlled it was they just fumigated the whole city, reduced the number of mosquitoes. And then that killed off the transmission of malaria. Any questions about epidemiology? Notifiable diseases are those that a physician are required by law to report to the public health service. And there are many of them. They depend on which state you're in, but generally all the serious diseases are notifiable diseases. Two terms of uh, epidemiology, morbidity, the incidence of a specific notifiable disease, the morbidity rate, the number of people affected in relation to the total population in a given time period. Like they talked about the morbidity rate of COVID-19, and that would be the number of people in the United States who have gotten COVID-19. And I don't know 
what they do if you get it more than once, because certainly that has happened with many patients. Actually. I don't know how that affects the morbidity rate, but uh, like I said, the morbidity rates, the number of people affected in relation to the total population in a given time period. The mortality is the deaths from a notifiable disease. The mortality rate, the number of deaths from a disease in relation to the population in a given time. I used to know the mortality rate of COVID-19. I think it's approaching or it's over 1 million deaths in the United States now. If it isn't 1 million, it's approaching 1 million. All right, any questions about epidemiology? We're actually on schedule, so let me start chapter 13, and I will not need to... Uh, lecture in the um, in the lab because we are on schedule now let's see there's a few other things I need to talk about Oh, I'm supposed to explain to you about my office hours. This is an online class. So if you want to talk to me during office hours, all you need to do is request, request it online. Uh, the easiest time to do it would be either during the lab or after the lab. If you don't mind it being public, it can even be during the lab when I'm just waiting for students to ask a question. But if you want privacy, we can wait until all other students have logged off, and that would be after the lab. If you want to do it at another time, you just need to schedule a time with me, and and uh, we can meet online over Zoom. Uh, any questions about any of that? Let me also state something that's in the syllabus, and I did cover it in the first day of term. Let me see if I can find it here. I think it's above that. Oh, words of advice and comfort. Uh, Sometimes it appears that your instructors are enemies, but in reality, there's very few instructors who will be your enemy. It is occasionally true that you might find one that is, but generally that won't be the case. We are in the education business to teach you guys, and it is our greatest accomplishment to see you guys succeed. That is our goal to get you guys to succeed. And that's the entire point of teaching. If you don't know, let me also tell you that you can learn this material on your own. In fact, if you were to learn the material on your own, you would probably learn it better than I could ever teach it to you. So why do we even have teachers? Why do we even have uh, education facilities. It's simply because it's easier learning from someone than it is to learn on your own. But you, I'm under no illusion, you guys can learn this material on your own. You do not need me. The only reason why I'm here is it's easier learning from me than it is to learn on your own. And if you were to learn it on your own, you actually would learn it better. And I know this from personal experience. When I was in college, this is a long time ago, I had an instructor who just could not teach. And I really enjoyed the topic. And I said, you know, I'm going to learn this material on my own. 
So I checked out the textbook, which is kind of unusual. We didn't have a textbook. And uh, that's partly the reason why I guess we are having a hard time learning from him. And then I just read the textbook and I learned the material. And I got an A in the class and I was one of the best students in the class. And the instructor thought I would be very friendly towards him because I was such a good learner and learned the material so well. And other students were really struggling and they didn't like him. And the reason was just because he was a lousy instructor. And they, the college knew that. That's why they only had him mainly teaching graduate students because he just couldn't relate to other students and had a hard time teaching. And he kind of knew that too. And uh, like I said, I learned the material on my own because I really wanted to. And I learned it better than I probably could have with him teaching it. In fact, I would have definitely learned it better because he was such a lousy instructor. So I'm under no illusion that I am needed. I'm only here because it is easier for you guys to learn from an instructor like me. However, it is our goal and certainly my major goal to help you succeed. And that is the greatest joy I will get out of teaching. So when you have a concern, if you need help, you know, just ask me. Most likely, I will bend over to help you. That doesn't mean I'll always be able to comp accommodate you. Like I can't give you 100% on the quiz, even though you'd like 100%, because we do have to keep standards. You do need to learn the material. But if you have a complaint, a concern, or some other... Uh, Concern, please come and talk to me. If you let them fester, things will only get worse. And I promise you, I will do my best to try and work them out. Doesn't mean I can accomplish you, uh, accommodate you, but I will try to make things better. Any questions about any of that? All right. Let's move on to the next lesson. Chapter 13, viruses, viroids, and prions. As is always, I have a first slide here showing you the major goals of this lesson and a rough outline. Of course, always know the terms. Uh, the major terms for this lesson are what's a capsid, an envelope, a spike, a bacteriophage, what is the lytic life cycle, the lysinogenic life cycle? What is a life cycle for that matter? Uh, what's a bacteria, uh, excuse me, a prophage? What is a provirus? What is a latent virus? What is a persistent infection? And actually the latent latency in a persistent infection is another life cycle and we'll talk about those. And then what's a prion? And finally, what is a viroid? Understand the characteristic, the structure, and the classification of viruses. Uh, one thing nice about this is when we're naming a virus, we don't have Latin names. There are no Latin names for viruses. And we'll talk about what kind of names there are. And then lastly, understand about, not lastly, third, uh, understand about viral multiplication. That's the goal of a virus, to multiply. And then lastly, understand what are prions, prion disease, and what are viroids. Any question about any of this? The only goal a virus has is to replicate. And how do they do this? A virus will invade a cell, a host cell, I meaning it has to be a specific cell the virus can invade, hijack the host cell, and then force the cell to make viral copies. The virus then will escape from the cell. I must open a link, I'm watching a little video about 
viral multiplication. Phage is a bacteriophage. We'll talk a little bit about that. It's just a bacterial virus. In the microscopic world of bacteria, a miniature act of piracy is about to take place. D4 bacteriophages. With their spider like tail fibers and prism shaped heads, these viral marauders plan to hijack an unsuspecting bacterium and use it as their own metabolic nursery. This E. coli bacterium has seen its last day. Binding to its surface, the virus injects its precious cargo of genetic material into the cell, commanding it to produce a new batch of T4 bacteriophages. In a final act, the bacterium is forced to self-destruct, releasing hundreds of viruses ready to kill again. Any questions about that movie? <laughs> Excuse me. So some general characteristics of viruses. Viruses are inert when the virus is with, not within its host cell. In fact, viruses outside of their host cell display little or no metabolic activity. They only have metabolic activity within their host cell. Viruses require a living host cell to multiply. We can say viruses are obligate intracellular parasites because they parasitize their host cell. And they require that host cell in order to reproduce. So that's why they're an obligate intracellular parasite. They multiply within living cells by using the host cell's enzymes, nucleic acid, amino acids, and other cellular components. Viruses have no ATP generating mechanism. Obviously they need ATP and how they get that ATP is they use their host cells ATP. Viruses contain either DNA or RNA for their genome, and it's one or the other, never both. And the DNA or the RNA is the innermost molecule within the virus. So here we're looking at a virus, and this edge of the virus has been cut away so we can see inside the virus. And inside we have their nucleic acid, which is their genome. And that nucleic acid is either DNA or RNA. It is never both. And then surrounding that uh, genome, we have a protein coat. And that's called the capsid, shown right here. And normally the capsid would be right here as well. And all viruses have a genome, either DNA or RNA, and a protein coat we call the capsid. Some viruses also have a lipid envelope outside of the protein coat. And that would be like right out here. Not all viruses have an envelope, only some of them do. Any questions about any of that? The host range of a virus is the range of cells that the virus can infect and multiply in. The host range is determined by specific 
host attachment sites called receptors, such as a certain cell wall or a certain flagella. And whatever the virus attaches to, we call that uh, host cell receptor. Most viruses also have molecules on the virus that bind to the receptor. And these are generally called uh, ligands or adherins, molecules on the virus that bind to the receptor on the host cell. Most viruses only infect the cells of about one species. In fact, viruses are so specific that typically they only infect certain cells of generally around one species. Uh, like HIV can only infect certain human cells like T cells, brain cells, I think it's macrophages as well, a few cells of people. And it is true that HIV can infect uh, one of the chimpanzees. So it affects those cells in the chimpanzee. However, HIV does not cause the disease AIDS in this chimpanzee, but the chimp can become infected with HIV. Uh, the point is, is that most viruses only infect certain cells of about one species. And the viruses are very specific in this. Other cells, if they were to get in, like HIV, if it were to get on your cat, for example, it's not going to infect their cells. It would certainly not cause AIDS in your cat, not HIV. There are other viruses, like simian immunodeficiency virus, which isn't quite AIDS, but it gives a cat something similar to, to AIDS. But that's a cat-specific virus, and it's not HIV. There are some viruses, not very many, but there are some viruses that do infect more than the cells of one species. Um, well, COVID-19 is actually one. It can infect certain mammals like cats and dogs and some other animals. What the heck is that called? The spiny ant eater. Some other mammals. Um, there are some viruses like encephalitis that can infect the cells of insects like mosquitoes. And then many mammals like horses, uh, cows, mice, other rodents, and then of course people, in which case that's a virus that can infect many different species. But most viruses can only infect uh, a few cells of one or about one species. And HIV is a good example. Any question about any of that? All right. Uh, viruses, when we're looking at their relative size, let me blow this slide up. The smallest virus is around 20 nanometers, a little more than 20 nanometers. <clears throat> I'm sure none of you have ever heard of uh, bacteriophage. I can't even read that. Uh, MS2. Uh, the smallest virus you've ever heard of is probably a polio virus. And it's a little larger, around 30 nanometers. But that's about the smallest virus we have. <laughs> Viruses can be much larger. Uh, the megavirus shown here is about 400 nanometers in diameter. Uh, that's approaching the size of the smallest prokaryotic cell around 400 nanometers in diameter. Most bacteria are a little bit bigger than that, like E. coli, which is bigger than your average bacteria, 
is 300 by 100 nanometers. Ebola is one of the longest viruses. And when we take a look at its length, it's approaching 1,000 nanometers. However, in a diameter, it's smaller than the megavirus because it's long and skinny. And then here we have a uh, red blood cell, and you can see that this is much larger than a prokaryote cell, and this is a little bit larger than the average prokaryotic cell, which is much larger than a virus. That's the main point here. Viruses and their size range from about 20 nanometers in diameter to 440 nanometers in diameter. And that's the diameter. When we go by the length, it can be a little bit longer because uh, Ebola is almost 1,000 nanometers long. But by diameter, it's less than 400 nanometers. Any questions about any of that? When we're talking about the virus structure, it's important to realize that we have a term virion, which means simply a single, mature, complete, infectious virus particle. So normally when we're talking about a virus, we're talking about a virion. Viruses can have a different genome. Their nucleic acid can be either DNA or RNA, but never both. The DNA and the or the RNA can be double-stranded or single-stranded. Double-stranded DNA is normal. Our cells mostly have double-stranded DNA. Single-stranded DNA is also normal. Our cells have single-stranded DNA whenever the DNA is being replicated or transcribed. And we can have a virus with single-stranded DNA for their genome. Double-stranded RNA is unheard of in our cells, but some viruses have double-stranded RNA for their genome. And some viruses have single-stranded RNA for their genome. If we're talking about a single-stranded RNA virus, it's important to just specify whether that single-strand RNA is the positive strand or the negative strand. And what we do is we call that the positive single-strand RNA virus or a negative single strand RNA virus. The positive single strand of the RNA is the RNA that can be read by the ribosome. So the ribosome can read the RNA genome as messenger RNA, and it will have AUG, that codon, to allow the ribosome to translate the viral genome, that's positive single-strand RNA. The negative single-strand RNA is the complement to the single-strand RNA. And the ribosomes cannot read negative single-strand RNA. It will not have the genome AUG, it will be, um, let's see, UAC instead. Any question about any of that? The RNA genome can be either linear in the DNA or RNA, or it can be circular. It just depends on the virus. Some viruses, like influenza virus, have their genome in several segments. And this should not be uh, unheard of to you because actually humans have their genomes in several segments. Humans have their genome in 46 segments and we call each of those segments a chromosome. In viruses, 
the term chromosome is not usually used. We just say a DNA molecule or a DNA segment, segment or an RNA molecule. We don't usually call it a chromosome because a chromosome is more than just for humans. It's more than just DNA. It's DNA with the associated proteins. And that's true even of prokaryotic cells. There is DNA and then proteins in the chromosome. In the virus, their genome uh, usually does not have the, the um, protein associated with it. And then what do you call a uh, RNA genome? We don't usually call the chromosome RNA. So and that's probably why the term chromosome is not used with viruses. All right, let's talk a little bit about the capsid. That's the protein coat that surrounds the genome of the virus. All viruses have a capsid. Let me blow the slide up. The capsid uh, is composed of subunits that we call capsomeres. There can be one capsomere in the capsid, like this virus here, it's just one capsomere, and then it repeats many times to make the capsid, the protein coat. But the capsomere doesn't have to be one. There can be several making up the protein coat. Um, let me show you a virus. Oh, here's one. Whoops. Oh, that's good enough. Uh, there's going to be one capsomere in the head portion of the capsid. And then there will be another capsomere in the sheath. In fact, there's probably two because there's the outside of the sheath. And then there's probably another capsomere in the, the base plate. And then another capsomere in the tail fiber. So there's at least one, two, three, four, at least five different uh, capsomeres in this protein, uh, in this protein of the virus. Let me go back now. If there is an envelope around the virus, then we call that an enveloped virus. If there is no envelope around the virus, like this virus has no envelope, we call this a naked virus. So that's a naked virus. This is an envelope virus. The envelope is a lipid bilayer, similar to the cell membrane. It does have proteins and carbohydrates in it. External to the... Uh, lipid envelope, there may be glycoprotein spikes in the virus. And usually the uh, glycoprotein spikes are in the envelope viruses. Uh, like this virus, there's the envelope right there. This right here, which you can barely see, is the capsid. And right there is the genome of the virus. And in this envelope right here, the blue, we have this purple, and those are the spikes. The spikes are usually glycoprotein spikes. The glycoprotein spikes tend to be the attachment point for the virus to bind to the host cell receptors, meaning the attachment points or the adherens or the ligands of the virus tend to be the outermost molecules. And in a virus that has spikes, the outermost molecules are on the spike. The spikes also serve as antigens. An antigen is a molecule that the host immune system recognizes as foreign. And the host immune system normally sees the outermost molecule. And so on a virus, the spikes also serve 
as the antigens for this virus. So the spikes are both the antigens that the host immune system recognizes as this molecule being, um, I guess this molecule here in the, in the spike, being foreign to the host. And then the host mounts an immune response against the virus or against the antigens of this virus. And then the spikes are also what the virus uses to attach to their host cell, their host, the receptors of the host cell. For this virus here, what molecules are serving as the antigens and as the adherents, the molecules of the virus that attach to the host cell receptors. What molecules? Okay, it's the outermost molecules of the virus. I've already told you that. Is anyone going to guess? All right. Nobody's going to guess, so you guys will have to answer that on your own. It's uh, time to end. So if there's no questions, I will pick up here next Tuesday. All right. I'll log off and see you. I will be in the lab just to answer questions from 6.30 to 6.45. If you don't have any questions, you don't need to show up in the lab.